Gnomes in the Witcherverse are a unique race with a lot of unique traits. So this video, I want to talk about the lore behind gnomes. Gnomes were the first race to occupy the continent, at least according to a majority of the lore that is out there and uh, according to the dwarves themselves. From the Blood of Elves, Siri questions if dwarves were first on their planet, to which a dwarf replies, Gnomes, to be honest. As far as this part of the world is concerned, because the world is unimaginably huge, Siri. Now this is a reference to the known world in The Witcher, which is the continent. If a race existed elsewhere, it isn't commonly known, nor does it really matter, though certainly there are other lands in the Witcherverse on this specific planet besides the continent. Gnomes can be recognized by their short height, typically around three feet tall. A gnome's waist will usually come just above a human male's knees, though like with humans, a gnome's height can vary. Gnomes are also known for their long pointed noses, teeth, and ears, though more so their noses is what they're known for. See, their noses are one of their most distinguishing marks, being twice as long as any other race. And due to their size, they have an incredible sense of smell, able to clearly identify individual herbs or scents. In fact, here is a passage describing a gnome's nose in the Witcher book, Baptism of Fire. Percival Scuttenbach was not a dwarf. From under his wet hood, instead of a tangled beard, protruded a very long and pointed nose, reliably identifying the nationality of the holder to be that of the old and noble race of gnomes. We get a further description of the gnome and characteristics of his race a little bit after this sentence in The Baptism of Fire. The passage says, the guide was Percival Scuttenbuck, the long-nosed gnome. Although his size and stature was smaller than that of the dwarves, he had equaled the amount of strength and his agility far surpassed theirs. During the march, he ran around tirelessly, rummaging in the bushes, darting forward and disappearing, then suddenly emerging nervously, making monkey gestures from a distance, giving a sign that everything was okay, they could go on. Sometimes he would come back quickly and give a report of obstacles on the trail. Whenever he returned, he gave the four children sitting on the cart a handful of blackberries, nuts, or some kind of weird, but clearly tasty food. So from the books, we learn that while they can be much more agile than dwarves, they have similar resilience to them. However, gnomes are both shorter and weaker than dwarves. Gnomes are also more slender in body than halflings. Which, side note, don't ever mess with halflings. I won't go into much description why, but you should know that halflings in the Witcherverse uh, have really good aim. Now, despite their more slender bodies and noses that help distinguish them from dwarves, even if a gnome is on the bigger side, another big distinction between gnomes and dwarves is their beards. While gnomes do occasionally sport short cut beards, most of them choose to be clean shaven. This is in contrast to dwarves just magnificent beards. Gnomes are known for having a variety of jobs, from jewelers to artisans, pawnbrokers to office boys for dwarven banks or anything in between. They've also been known to become burglars or highway thieves. Aren't known for being particularly good with magic. It, it's an uncommon skill among gnomes, but some gnomes are able to cast a wide variety of counter spells. Those that can use magic and also like to steal have been known to master the invisibility spell so they can snatch what they want. Now, something I love about the gnomes is despite their small size, or maybe because of it, they are known as a race that can party hard. There is a saying in verse, stir up trouble like a tipsy gnome. Though alcohol isn't needed for gnomes to be extra, it wouldn't be odd to see a gnome grab their long nose with their fingers and blow it so it sounds like a horn. There's also a saying, by the way, fuck like a drunken gnome. 
I do want to note though, despite the insinuation that they really, really like sex, they don't produce children at the rate humans do. Darn horny humans are just super breeders in the Witcherverse compared to all the other races. Beyond that, not a lot is known about gnomes and their sexual activity. So, moving on, if a gnome or dwarf wants to show that they disagree with you, they will blow raspberries in your direction or put a super hot piece of metal in your underwear. They really just are the, the best race. Now, if you would like to insult a gnome, I'm not sure why you would want to, but if you want to, you can call them a disgusting underground goblin or some insult comparing them to kobolds because, oh boy, do they hate kobolds. This is because they are in constant conflict with the creatures and in certain areas, a standing army is needed to deal with them. Though this is more of a problem north of the Yuruga. Though gnomes do live in a few spots above and below the Yuruga. Gnomes generally form large communes wherever they are, led by councils or individuals that are chosen by gnomes for their extraordinary qualities. While they have a clan structure, they don't veer towards dictatorship or any sort of authoritative regime. Dwarves, on the other hand, can get super controlling in how things are handled in their cities, to the point where whether you can wear suspenders and how close to a mine you can whistle are heavily regulated. Even how quickly you can eat your fish is controlled. Though Mahikam is a dwarven town and has some of these insane rules, because of their closeness with them, gnomes can often be found living in the location peacefully with them. These mountains are actually a really good place for gnomes and dwarves, by the way, because they're not generally attacked because it's well known that you don't go after gnomes and dwarves in their homes. Actually, the word commando in the Witcher verse comes from the gnomes and the true extent of their armies in the mountains aren't known by outsiders. So generally, besides the kobolds and every once in a while being attacked, the mountains are safe for the gnomes and dwarves. Besides that, gnomes can be found in the underground town beneath modern day Marabor or in the citadel on Mount Cremora. Gnomes are also known to live in human cities as well, but this is a more touchy subject. Unlike the elves, the gnomes, dwarves, and halflings, they've all tried to live amongst the humans peacefully when they came via the conjunction of spheres about 1500 years before the books and shows. There is or was a harmony for a while, but even at the height of working together, kind stuck with kind. Dwarven craftsmen were more likely to tolerate a camp of no miners over humans. All non-humans have a somewhat distant relationship with humans. According to some, it took 100 years to get humans to accept non-humans in their towns, but it was done. I also find that a little bit funny that the humans came after all these races and they had a hard time accepting them into their towns on the other race's continent. But as one dwarf put it this way, for over 100 years, we've been trying to come to terms with the humans. The halflings, gnomes, us, even the elves. Damn it all, it took a hundred years, but somehow or other, we managed to live a common life next to each other, together. We managed to partially convince humans that we're not so very different. However, despite all these attempts for humans to get along with the other races, though, again, elves were much more reserved and less likely to reach out, the relationship between humans and non-humans broke down as the elves and Nilfgaard fought the northern kingdoms. In fact, in a time of contempt, a dwarf shares how bad relations have gotten between humans and non-humans since the elves and Nilfgaard started to pick a fight with the northern kingdoms. Poll tax and winter tax were doubled. The taxes which directly fund the army pay. All merchants and businessmen must make additional payments to the royal treasury. The tithe, a whole new tax, one tenth of all profits. Dwarves, gnomes, elves, and halflings pay higher poll tax. If they're involved in commerce or manufacture, they're also burdened with the non-human income tax a 10 out of every 100. Because of all this, I have to give up to the state more than 60% of my income. My bank, all branches included, pays the four kingdoms annually 600 marks. Allow me to elaborate. It's almost three times the charge of a noble duke or count with a huge estate. This discrimination as the war continued between Nilfgaard and the Northern Kingdoms would further strain human gnome relations. 
When they die, they cremate their dead, though this might not have to do with any religious beliefs. Gnomes have worshipped deities before, but generally follow ones that are about cooperation and making the world a better place through nonviolence. One well known is the goddess of harvest and fertility, similar to Melitella. Despite not having a lot of knowledge of their religions, gnomes have used religious exemption to get out of summons from human monarchs or recruitment in wars. They are skilled jewelers, gem cutters, smiths, metal workers, and alchemists. They are capable of using ancient patterns, methods, and techniques to make amazing weapons. If you want one of the best made swords on the continent, you want to get it from a gnome. Now, gnomish weapons are known for being unique, and it is super easy to spot them. While dwarves typically temper the steel and forge the main layers, Gnomes are the ones that sharpen it and do the decorative cutting in modern witcher time, also in past time. However, there is one type of famous gnomish sword no longer in production. Those are called guihairs. They are forged with dark iron resulting in incredibly light and sharp blades. The blade edges are patterned into waves and ray skins were wrapped around the hilts to make for a better grip and less slippage. In fact, Ciri at one point is gifted one of these swords and it's a big deal. Gnomes though are really good at forging their weapons with dark iron and they're able to break through welds to reduce the weight and sharpen them into flame shaped blades that cut like razors. Finally, let's talk about two famous gnomes in the Witcher verse. You may find the first gnome I wanna talk about a gnome named Rumpelstilt, to be a bit familiar. This gnome once helped a woman named Zivlina onto the Matina throne with the promise when she had her first child, she would turn it over to the gnome. Zevlina agreed and got her throne, but when she had her first child and Rumpelstilt went to collect it, she refused him and used magic to banish him from her kingdom. Then the plague came to her land, killing her and her child. While I'm not saying the gnome killed them or brought the plague, this story is used in verse to explain the consequences of going against destiny or the law of surprise. Second and lastly, some sort of well-known gnomes are the seven gnomes. So instead of the seven dwarves, we have the seven gnomes in the Witcher verse that served under Remfrey, this crazy ex-princess. So when Renfri escaped her home and the assassination attempts, she eventually made it to Mahaikam where she met seven gnomes. She convinced the gnomes that instead of working in the mines, it was more profitable to rob merchants on the road. Because Renfri preferred to kill her victims by impaling them on sharp poles, she earned the name Shrike, and the gnomes just went completely along with this. One time her pursuers tried to kill her with an apple seasoned with nightshade. Luckily, one of her seven gnomes saved her with a medicine that made her puke so much, she thought she'd puke her insides out. Renfrey and her gnomes remained terrors in the whole territory until one day the gnomes got into an argument and slaughtered each other with knives. Only Renfrey survived. Okay, so that was gnomes in the Witcherverse. Like, subscribe, come back for more lore videos for the Witcherverse.